a strange letter written by the mysterious leader of the Olympian Society, addressed to famous UFO eyewitness Kenneth Arnold, what connection does this cult have with the small Southern California town? While little is known about their leader, researchers have tracked down his former mountainside home and the location of the cult's compound. Fearing an impending apocalypse, they claim to have contact with interplanetary beings who held the solution for man's salvation. So it's the middle of 2020. I'm at home scrolling through Instagram, the only kind of cryptid paranormal UFO thing I'm doing at the time is my podcast, Cryptid Campfire. So I'm just kind of browsing through Instagram, looking at different posts from people in the community. I came across an Instagram story posted by Pacific North Weird that says something along the lines of, do I know anyone who lives in or near Temecula, California? doing research into this area and I'm looking for someone to help me out. This caught my attention because I'm from Temecula. If someone was doing research into my hometown, I wanted to know about it. So I reached out. The person who runs Pacific North Weird is a man named Vince Izunza and he messaged me back. I'm researching a letter sent from Temecula back in 1947 from an organization called the Olympian Society. I don't know much about them, but I believe they were a cult that believed Noah's Ark was buried within a hill in Temecula called Mount Olympus. The leader was named Everett H. Lee. Anything about that sound familiar? None of that sounded familiar to me. I had no idea who the Olympian Society was, Everett H. Lee, nothing like that. It was completely bizarre to me. And honestly, the idea of, of a mystery existing in my hometown got me really, really excited. I decided to do a little bit of digging. So Temecula, California is a long ways away from where I am now. So I, my research started on the internet. Eventually found some newspaper articles. Uh, Everett Lee appeared to be a source of much controversy in the Los Angeles area at the time. Uh, there was a lawsuit filed by a husband who says that his wife had taken all their life savings and had joined this weird cultist who called himself the son of god out on this mountain uh, in Temecula. One of the Olympian society's beliefs that I discovered was that they thought that the entire west coast of the United States would flood and that the only safe place from this calamity would be Mount Olympus. So the first thing I found was a Temecula Valley Historical Society newsletter dated from 2002. It was an article written by Gene Knott recounting a story that was told to him by his father. This story has been banging around in my head for quite some time. My father told it to me many years ago. I think it's interesting because it reflects some of our past and relates to our present. Some things seem very important to some people while they are trivial to others. Some people just need a cause to rally around. Others follow their own mind. Temecula wasn't without its own cult of believers. Down the road about three miles south of the present Pachanga Casino is a tunnel bored into the side of a hill. Nobody knows how far back it goes, but some followers who believed in another person's dream dug it by hand. I don't remember the names of the two people who led these followers, so let's just call them Smith and Jones. Mr. Smith had a vision that the area was the Holy Land, and the center of the hill contained a biblical city, and somewhere in the upper level of this hill, they would discover Noah's Ark. 
they called this hill Mount Olympus. Smith's partner believed this story, and the two started to preach to others about their beliefs, and soon they had a following. They built a few small dwellings on their property to house their new members, who provided the labor to dig a tunnel to locate the lost city. Some people talked of gold and riches that this close-knit group was after, but it was their belief in their God and their interpretation of the Bible that drove them to dig in the earth. Today, they would be called religious fanatics. This story begins in the late 1930s, after the tunnel digging was in process. My dad, Vernon Knott, used to work at Knott's garage in his spare time. He was attending Elsinore High School and worked after school and on weekends for Grandpa. One Saturday, Dad was driving Grandpa's tow truck on a service call down the Paula Road. After he passed Pachanga Creek, he saw Mr. Jones's car sitting along the road. He stopped to see whether Jones was broke down, needed any help or anything. Dad walked up to the car, called to Jones, and when Jones didn't respond, Dad reached in to touch him. At that moment, Dad knew what was wrong. Mr. Jones was dead. Dad pulled his hand away and made a hasty retreat to the tow truck. Dad still had his service call to attend to, but he couldn't just leave Mr. Jones sitting alongside the road, so he drove to inform Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith asked Dad to help get Mr. Jones back to their place, and Dad obliged. He felt it was the least he could do. Dad drove Smith back to Jones's car and helped slide the body into the passenger seat. Dad was ready to make a hasty exit, but Mr. Smith asked him to follow him back to their house. I can just imagine what was going through Dad's head by this time, such as, why did I stop in the first place? Or, how did I get into this? Dad followed Mr. Smith, who was driving with a very dead Mr. Jones sitting in the passenger seat, back to their place at the base of Mount Olympus. He helped Mr. Smith carry Mr. Jones's body into one of the houses and put him into bed. All the while, Smith was talking to Jones, saying he was going to be all right and he should just relax and get some rest. He assured Dad that Jones was okay, and he just needed to sleep for a while. After putting Mr. Jones to bed, Dad made a rapid exit and went on with his service call. He didn't see anyone from Mount Olympus for quite a while, nor hear anything more until Mr. Smith came by the garage for gas one day. He asked how Mr. Jones was doing, to which Mr. Smith answered, Mr. Jones is no longer with us. I had a long talk with him the other night, and he said he was very tired and just didn't want to come back to this world. I told him that I understood, and we will miss him and wished him well. Years later after the property changed hands, I talked to the owner and asked if he knew anything about Mr. Smith and if the tunnel still existed. He said it did, but the entrance was boarded shut. I asked if he had ever been back into the tunnel. He said, no, it isn't even shored. I asked if he had any idea how far into Mount Olympus the tunnel went, and he said he had taken a mirror to reflect sunlight and had shined it into the tunnel. The tunnel curved so he couldn't see very far, but it went back a heck of a long way. The cult disappeared way before my time, and was the end of Temecula's version of Heaven's Gate. There's a lot of questions from that story. Mr. Smith, a mysterious Mr. Jones, the idea of Noah's Ark being buried on Mount Olympus, the idea of a mine shaft. Obviously, Gene Knott was looking for answers to these questions as well, and I wanted to find out more. I sent that newsletter over to Vince, and he said that he had already found that. So it was time to have a phone call. And he revealed to me why he was looking into the Olympian Society in the first place. In 2019, when we had our first flying saucer party, Kenneth Arnold's granddaughter, Chanel Shans, uh, came over from Boise to do a speech. And she was so gracious, she donated this really cryptic, strange letter that had been addressed to her grandfather back in 1947, just a mere three days after his historic sighting. The Olympian Society Incorporated, Mount Olympus, Temecula, California, June 27, 1947. Mr. Kenneth Arnold, Boise, Idaho. My dear sir, the heading on an article in the Los Angeles Times newspaper of today, folks elsewhere in U.S. tell of flying what's-its, but others still doubt. 
got my attention and is the reason of this letter to you as one of whom they quote. Because of certain knowledge I have of many things going on, and of which the world as yet knows nothing, I know you and others with you are under no illusion or false assumptions when you report seeing objects moving across the sky. This time it is the doubting ones of the truth of what you saw who are haywire. To be sure that which you and others have been seeing is that of which I know has been put forth in the skies of late, I am enclosing a form I will ask you to please fill in in return, and for which I now convey to you a grateful appreciation for same. I do assure you these objects of the sky will never bring harm to anyone, but before we are out of the muddle we are now in, they will prove to be a great blessing. I will say that if the scientists or wise men of Los Angeles would only learn of the real reason for the continuous fogs for the greater part of the day over their city and surrounding country during the past four or five weeks, then they would be ready to learn about the objects you and others are seeing in the sky. And I will say many of such objects have been passing over Los Angeles. Recently, but a blanket of fog was thrown over to hide them as they move towards their ultimate destiny. Once I gather all available data, a report will be issued unless the Almighty brings his vengeance to bear on the earth in the meantime. Yours for the truths that lead to light. Everett H. Lee, President, The Olympian Society Incorporated. The letter is a trip. Very messianic. It sounds like this guy is a cult leader. He talks about these continuous fogs blanketing Los Angeles and how they're obscuring the ultimate destiny of these flying objects. And he explains how he knows like, the truth about them, but he's not yet ready to reveal it. Just very culty. One of the most important things that has to be discussed when talking about the letter is who it's addressed to. Kenneth Arnold, 1947. If you are deeply immersed in UFO history, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you're kind of like me and you didn't know exactly who that was, well, I'm going to explain it. I wouldn't feel right telling this story without including a member of Kenneth Arnold's family. So in September of 2022, I went to Chehalis, Washington and interviewed Chanel Shans, his granddaughter. My grandfather was, uh, he was a very kind, loving man, animal lover. Um, I grew up with him since my mom was the only uh, child that stayed in town. We ended up taking care of my grandmother when she was dying, you know, but my grandfather died when I was eight years old. Ashes were sprinkled over a Japanese garden in Seattle. He, he loved Seattle, but loved the weather in Idaho better, you know. But he did a lot of business flying all around the Northwest. Based out of Boise, Idaho, Kenneth Arnold was a private pilot delivering goods to all over the Pacific Northwest. He did this for his own company, Great Western Fire Control Supply. He uh, would sell fire suppression equipment to small businesses in the Northwest, Idaho, Washington, Oregon. And he would fly his plane around to his clients. So on June 24th, 1947, Kenneth Arnold left Chehalis, Washington and was en route to Yakima, Washington. And on the way, he thought he would go down over by Mount Rainier to look for a crashed airplane that had uh, disappeared a, a few months prior. The reward at the time for finding the wreckage was about $5,000, which even in today's money is still a pretty good chunk of change, but I can only imagine it was even more back in the 1940s. He looks for the wreckage for about an hour, doesn't find it, and he climbs to about 9,000 feet. Bright flashes hit the surface of Kenneth Arnold's aircraft. He is starting to freak out because he thinks that maybe he's too close to another aircraft. He doesn't know exactly what's going on. So he starts looking around. I observed a chain of nine peculiar aircraft flying north to south at approximately 9,500 feet elevation and going seemingly in a definite direction of about 170 degrees. I watched as these objects approached the snow border of Mount Rainier. 
all the time thinking that I was observing a whole formation of jets. They were flying diagonally in echelon formation, with a larger gap in their echelon between the first four and last five. What startled me most at this point was the fact that I could not find any tails on them. Maybe it would be best to describe their flight characteristics as very similar to a formation of geese in a rather chain-like line, as if they were linked together. One of the things that really amazes Arnold about these craft is how fast they're moving. He clocks their speed at 1,700 miles per hour, which is a completely unheard of speed for any aircraft known at that time. And when he arrives in Yakima, he tells his story, and suddenly things just go haywire. Everyone is talking about this sighting. As your duty as a pilot, you're supposed to report what you see, you know, just like, um, you know, for intelligence or security for the United States, you know, if somebody was um, invading our airspace, you'd pilots would want to report that. A reporter um, asks him to describe the way these craft flew. As I put it to newsmen in Pendleton, Oregon, they flew like a saucer would if you skipped it across the water. So the press takes this and turns it into he saw flying saucers. So that magical phrase just starts from that moment here in Chehalis, Washington, and takes over the entire world. But until you know UFO was a thing, everything in the sky was called a flying saucer. Kenneth Arnold and what he saw that day became known all over the world. And as a result, he started receiving a bunch of letters, people asking questions, government investigations, and of course, a letter from the Olympian Society. The letter that Everett Lee wrote is dated three days after Kenneth Arnold's sighting, which is an extremely quick turnaround rate at that time. I'm not sure if Kenneth Arnold saw this particular letter or if he read it, but I can't exactly blame him if it got lost in the shuffle of thousands of letters. Yeah, looking through my grandfather's files, I would always do that out of boredom sometimes just to see what he had. And that letter was in the file and my mom took notice to it. And she put it in her briefcase. She just uh, one day whipped it out. I go, mom, please, can I have that letter? It's always made me wonder, you know. I was really interested in that letter and I knew that we were going to do another flying saucer party. So I thought, I'm gonna start researching this and try to see what I can find out about this Everett Lee guy and this Olympian Society and present it at the next flying saucer party. Well, COVID happened, so we took a little two-year hiatus. So while I was in Washington last year, I actually got to take part in the Chehalis Flying Saucer Party. These are the Kenneth Arnold Crescents. Look at that. Look at that. June 24th, 1947, old Ken Arnold flew out of the Chehalis Airport and witnessed nine strange aircraft flying near Mount Rainier. So the Chehalis Flying Saucer Party is a uh, celebration uh, put on by the Lewis County Historical Museum and it is meant to honor the pop culture contributions of Kenneth Arnold. A lot of people didn't know that the concept of the flying saucer started in Chehalis, Washington. And we wanted to change that, give, give the, the city um, some pride in that really quirky, albeit important, uh, moment in, in pop culture. Unique to our celebration is the saucer drop. We get out uh, at the gazebo outside of the museum, big crowd awaits, and we toss little, little mini flying saucers out at the crowd. Each saucer has a little slip of paper attached to the bottom that has some sort of prize or discount for a local business. And I'm proud of that one especially because the saucer drop was actually a really old Chehalis tradition back in the 60s and 70s. It used to be this festival here called Crazy Days and the fire department would show up and
it with their snorkel truck and they would toss little paper flying saucers out onto the crowd and they would have little prizes on them. My grandfather's with me and I'm sure he's proud of, you know, what I'm doing because like, you know, I, I definitely want him uh, remembered for his historical sighting. You know, my grandfather was in the right place at the right time and uh, was the right person to wake everyone up and say, hey, I saw this, oh my gosh, you know, what is this? His whole life was dedicated to finding the answer for these flying saucers and what they truly were. Even at, in 1984 when he passed away, he felt, he felt like there was no answer. So with the limited information I have with the letter written to Kenneth Arnold, the Temecula Valley Historical Society newsletter, I decide that I'm going to start looking for the mine. Apparently, uh, the Olympian Society had dug a tunnel into the side of Mount Olympus in search of some sort of biblical city or maybe even Noah's Ark. The toughest part was finding Mount Olympus because for the longest time it didn't show up on Google Maps or Apple Maps or anything like that. We had some vague directions from the newsletter, but that didn't give me an exact location. So Vince actually dug into some old topographical maps and he found Mount Olympus. And I was able to apply that to my Google Maps. And it's actually quite big, so the environment of Temecula is like a chaparral. We have lots of bushes, lots of Russian tumbleweed, coastal oaks, things like that. Not only are you searching a wide swath of land, but you're also searching some pretty tough terrain. So I start looking in registries of old abandoned mines in the state of California, and I can't find any that are marked for Mount Olympus in Temecula. I just had to keep going in person. One of the times I went, I actually visited a neighboring town called Rainbow, California, which is actually the other side of Mount Olympus. I found the Mount Olympus Estates. For a while, I thought that might be the location of the compound and maybe the mine. However, it's just a series of estates and, and I didn't really want to do a whole lot of poking around. So for a while, I thought that might be the end of the search. That was until April of 2021. Vince sends me an email. Vince revealed that Everett Lee was born on Prince Edward Island, Canada in 1882 and immigrated to the United States at some point. Vince was also able to dig up a 1940 census of Temecula, California, in which he found Everett Lee listed as the head of the Olympian Society, as well as five other people living with him. One of which was his wife, Carolyn Lee, Epinesa Phillips, Ronald Fitzgerald, Ida M. Ketchner and John South. Vince did a little bit of digging into some of the members listed in that census. The most important at the time was Ronald Fitzgerald. We knew from the newsletter that there was a mine or a tunnel bored into the side of Mount Olympus. So Vince pulled up a passport application from 1919. Fitzgerald lists his occupation as a mining engineer which would make him qualified to supervise the construction of a mine. But Vince was still able to pull up one more extremely valuable piece of information. One huge resource that I stumbled upon was this resource management plan for the Mount Olympus Preserve, which was put out by the San Diego County Parks and Recreation. And there's a little section in there where they actually do a history of the site. Records show that the west half of the southeast quarter of Section 4, all of the southeast portion of Section 8, and the southwest quarter of Section 9 was patented by Everett Harvey Lee. Under the Homestead Entry Stock Raising Act, a total of 300 acres was granted to him in 1936. Lee, born in Victoria, Canada in 1882, immigrated to Southern California in 1925 and applied for a declaration of intention to become a citizen in Los Angeles District Court in 1928. Records show Mr. Lee died in Riverside in 1972. A public school teacher, he resided in Long Beach when he applied for citizenship. 
Once Lee acquired the land in 1936, he had three years to make improvements to his properties. Then full title would be granted, and the land could be sold free and clear. Clearly, Lee did not have the ability to work the property, and any development plans he had were quickly abandoned. The Lee property belonged to the U.S. government when James Boynton Smith was given the deed in 1939. This suggests that Lee did not follow through on his claim per regulations associated with the Stock Raising Act, but a structure and a water collection system at the north end of the preserve in a site known as The Compound may have been built by Lee before Smith assumed the title. So we now knew when Everett Lee purchased the land. We also know that he lost the land in 1939, and for a period of time it belonged to a man named James Boynton Smith, who isn't on that 1940 census of the Olympian Society, so I'm not exactly sure who he is, or what his relationship to Everett Lee was. So for context, bringing everything back together, when Everett Lee wrote that letter to Kenneth Arnold in 1947, the compound belonged to a different person. And then by 1953, just six years after the Kenneth Arnold letter, the property was deeded to a man named Whitney H. Slocum, who was at one time a write-in candidate for the Greenback Party. Uh, Slocum was also a suspected nudist. In the 1940s and the 1950s, the term Olympic or Olympian was kind of a code word for nudist societies. Surrounding that, I discovered that there are some really prevalent rumors that the Olympian Society either was or became or was somehow connected to a, a nudist colony and that the Olympian Society property itself was used for nudist parties, uh, even attracting the likes of Hollywood's Errol Flynn. So like, were all these people just running around naked up there on the mountain? And they're writing letters about UFOs and like, hey, Kenneth Arnold, come hang out with us. It seems weird. I, I don't, I, <laughs> I don't know. So on one of our subsequent phone calls, Vince had a hunch about an oak tree that was planted by the Olympian Society. And the resource management plan actually refers to one as well. The remains of the compound are near a lone Engelman oak that they believed was planted there for ornamental purposes back at the time. So going through a series of maps, I actually like located the Engelman Oak, and I sent that map to Eli. He sent me the coordinates for it, and I went out and I checked it out. All right, Vince, I believe this is the area on the map. Um, as you can see, it's quite the grove here. Um, I might try to hike up this way a little bit um, to see where that might take me. Maybe that's it. Maybe this is the tree. I mean, this has got to be it, right? There's a single solitary tree. I just, I'm not sure. I'm not great at identifying trees here, but is this an oak? And I noticed that there's a path leading up the mountain. We got this pathway up the mountain here and I decided to follow it. Going up the mountain a little bit, just to see, maybe we can see an entrance to a mine or something that might look like a mine. And I'm not really prepared. I think I'm wearing sandals or Crocs or something. I'm not gonna lie, I'm tired. It's like 90 degrees and I didn't bring any water. This was honestly a very um, improvised trip. I'm wearing sandals. I don't want to say that I had given up hope of finding this place by this point, but I had been up there two or three times and found absolutely nothing. So I went ill-prepared thinking that I wasn't going to find anything. Of course, I'm walking up the mountain. I'm getting tired. I'm 
thinking about going back and I stop. You see that? Looks to be a part of a windmill. Like bam, right there, windmill. And I'm like, this this is it. This this is the day. The path keeps going. I just found this. Burnt, old doors, concrete base. Not sure what this is. This is a different one, a second one that I found further on up the trail. The other one is maybe a hundred feet back that way. All right, so I just came up the path this way. Um, appears to be more burned things here. And look at this. There's a building up there, and the path leads right up to it. There's the windmill. The building is just behind it here. Well, here it is. I wasn't scared. You know, I didn't get any creepy vibes or anything like that. I'm not gonna play that up. They just seem like old, dilapidated structures. Looks to be an old chicken coop. another building there. Looks like there's a total of three buildings. Yeah, definitely an old chicken coop. Right. Definitely looks like some old living quarters. Beer, people have been drinking here. Newspapers, broken glass everywhere. It's hard to tell how old these are. Better homes and gardens for 1957. I don't see anything else up here. As you can see, the side is definitely destroyed. Like I knew it was real. Everything that Vince and I had been digging into, it was real at that point. Everett Lee lived here for a period of time, the 1940 census. It was here, it was this location. It, it, it's the resource management plan talked about that, talked about this. You have to admit though, that's the view of Temecula Valley. You can see it all from right here. Then the adventure kind of came to a halt because I started doing Beyond the Trail. Went to Maine, I went to Bluff Creek, I went to Mount Hood, Bigfoot Mountain. I'm talking about Bigfoot Mountain again and I'm, it's not even a Bigfoot episode. Everything's coming full circle. And if you like this, you should subscribe. That was, that was smooth. That was real smooth. So fast forward almost a year to July, 2022. Vince finds an obituary. Not just any obituary, the obituary for John B. South, who, if you recall, was on the 1940 census for the Olympian Society. I, I just, I just, I'm gonna read it out to you because it's actually insane. Services were held last Saturday at the Temecula Valley Cemetery for John B. South, 64, of Mount Olympus near Temecula, who died of a heart attack minutes after he had parked his car at the side of the highway near the valley community. A school bus driver reported suspicious circumstances about the driver's actions at Knott's garage, and the owner of the garage, Al Knott, investigated and discovered the body. Mr. South was a member of the Olympian Society, a nationwide religious cult with headquarters on Mount Olympus in San Diego County. The body was taken to the society headquarters by Everett Lee, who was in charge of services. So we know who Mr. Jones was. We know that Mr. Jones and the story told to Al Knott by his father was true. And now we had multiple sources confirming the same thing. And as a historian, 
that's what you're looking for. You're looking for primary source documents that confirm the same thing. So now we had a second-hand account of what happened and a primary source document recounting the same event. So apparently, uh, John B. South was considered a co-leader of the Olympian Society, right alongside Everett H. Lee. It's very likely that he's buried somewhere on the property there. And so now the next step seemed to be looking for his grave. I put a post in the Facebook group for the Temecula Valley Historical Society, and Rebecca Farnbach tells me to email her. Rebecca has been with the Temecula Valley Historical Society for decades. Her and her husband did a lot of work maintaining and preserving the history of Temecula, California. And I'm really, really thankful that she and I have become friends and have really gone in to uncover more about the Olympian Society together. I first heard about the Olympian Society about 15 or 17 years ago. I was editor of the Temecula Valley Historical Society newsletter at the time. And someone asked, what do you know about the Olympian Society? And I said, I don't know a thing about it. I have never heard about it. So I put a little note in our Historical Society newsletter. If anybody knew anything about it, to please let me know. So this encounter that was repeated to me by the tow truck driver's son, Gene Knott, was the very first I ever heard. And I kept putting feelers out there and I got nothing. I, I communicated a little bit with Chanel and that gave me a little bit of insight of, on Mr. Lee. And then came Eli Watson and, and asked. And so at that point, I opened up kind of a, a news group, an email news group, and, and just um, contacted a number of people, about eight different people who may know something about anything. And then from there, with the help of Jeffrey Harmon and a few other people, we got little parts put together until we found out more as much as we know today. Unfortunately, through her contacts, we couldn't find John B. South's grave, which means he might be buried somewhere on Mount Olympus. So at this point, we have the missing grave of John B. South and the compound itself. And while the compound is like super rad and super cool, it doesn't really provide much in the way of information. It didn't really shine a light on Everett Lee and who he was as a person. It may be shown a light on like his morning view. I mean, imagine waking up to this view. I mean, it's beautiful. But we don't know much about who he was or what he was thinking. He was wooing away people's wives, apparently, and convinced a bunch of people to live with him there, but we don't know why. Vince was able to uncover several copyrights created by Everett Lee copyrights for different books that were written by him. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any copies of them. And these books aren't in circulation anymore. It's not like you can find them on Amazon, you can't find them on eBay. But Vince was able to find one. This was at the Special Collections Division at the Langston Library at University of California, Irvine. The book is called Universal Law and Order Supersedes Civilized Hell which rolls right off the tongue. So in August of 2022, I submitted a request to view this book. And I got an email on August 8th that my request had been canceled. They were unable to locate the book. And that could mean multiple things, that it got lost or it was mislabeled or someone stole it. Like that was a big bummer. <laughs> the only available book written by Everett Lee it was like right there in front of us and then it just vanished until August 24th. I was emailed back. It was available for me to go view. So on August 30th, I went in person to see the book that Everett Lee had written. Holding the book in my hands was, in a lot of ways, like similar to finding the compound for me. It proved to me that this was real. You know, it's 
one thing to come across these people in newspaper articles and stuff like that, but to know that they had written books, to find where they lived, and uh, to, to get a piece of history in your hands. It's truly something special. The book isn't even really a book, it's, it's like a pamphlet. It's got this green paper cover. Um, I was surprised at how well it was preserved. I mean, it was copyrighted in 1956, published around that time. Well, the title pretty much describes the book. Uh, Everett Lee is talking about how there is this secret knowledge that he is in possession of that if you adhere to that, then you can escape the hell that is modern civilization. Like most cult leaders, he feels the rest of the world is going in the wrong direction and are controlled by weird Luciferian forces. But his universal law is the way out. And included in the first page is the following statement. Everett H. Lee, as now known, has been down through the ages and is so known at the present time in the spiritual world as Enoch Elijah John, a master of universal law. It's pretty clear like right off the bat, this is like super philosophical, religious, you know, cult leader. It feels like a cult leader wrote this. It seems that Lee's um, venture was somewhat of a, what I'm gonna call a new age religious type adventure. So I know there are a lot of like different versions of what new age is. To me, um, when we worship our Supreme God as a Christian, well, that's pretty well defined. We, we all understand that, that's pretty universal. But with the new age, they worship what the creator has put inside them and they are wanting to expand and understand. So it's more of a self-exploration rather than a God adoration. And maybe there's an aspect of adoring God for what he has done inside them. But it's almost like the God part is in, uh, penetrated into the man in a different way than we do in mainstream Christianity. Which makes sense with one of the early pages of the book, why, I mean, he's applying a kind of new ideology onto an older faith is what it seems like. He is also the imprimatur for the palimpsest, consisting of 20 books of 20 chapters each, with the unadulterated truth as given by the All High Supreme Architect of the Universe, of which the first book has been issued and the second is now in the process of printing. Palimpsest is a reference to an old practice of reusing clay tablets or papers or papyrus that had already been written on to write something new. But not only that, and using what's in it already to create something new. So if you're thinking about what he's doing, he's taking the old faith of Christianity and applying his new precepts to it. He called himself humanity's friend. And this is where I wonder if there was a little bit of that Messiah complex. He believed that the New Age light or enlightenment would usher in universal brotherhood and a new social order. He appears to have believed in reincarnation because he wrote, Everett H. Lee, now known, has been down through the ages, as is so known at the present time in the spiritual world, as Enoch Elijah John. So Enoch and Elijah are the only people in the Bible to not die. They were whisked away and in, straight into heaven. But then that leaves John as the kind of oddball, but John was the disciple that wrote the book of Revelation. In his June 27th, 1947 letter to Kenneth Arnold, he claims he knows things because God has revealed them to him, both of the present and the future. And it's clear from newspaper documents and even his own writings, he believed that we were in some sort of apocalypse, that this was the end times. And perhaps that's the connection between Enoch, Elijah, John.
we have to begin with contextualizing Everett Lee's life. He was born in 1882 in Canada. He was baptized on November 16th of the same year, so he probably grew up highly religious. He immigrates to the United States. He writes a letter to Kenneth Arnold in 1947, and he publishes Universal Law and Order Supersedes Civilized Hell in 1956. Think about some of the things he's seen at that point. He's seen electricity become mainstream, the invention of the airplane, the invention of the automobile. He's seen World War I, World War II, the invention of nuclear and atomic weapons. Think about how he was living without electricity, without modern day amenities, to being in 1956 where television is a thing and you have electricity in your home and there's the threat that, you know, nuclear weapons are going to destroy the world. I mean, it's a very different world than he was born into. Can't blame him for thinking that the world was moving away from God or universal law, as he calls it. His basic argument throughout the whole book is that the world is changing for the worse. We're creating civilized hell, and it, we're getting further and further away from God or the universal law. And he compares himself to George Washington and Abraham Lincoln as sort of a spiritual revolutionary. He's gonna be the one to bring new change to the culture of the American public. One really interesting part of the book is when he describes being on Mount Olympus and this entity comes down and visits him from a planetary system that would dwarf ours in size. Obviously, that's an extraterrestrial contact right there. But he's talking about this pretty early, or at least right in the, the bloom of the contactee era. So if Everett Lee knew about UFOs, and if he had contact with UFOs, with interplanetary visitors, like he says in his book, that would make him a contactee. I don't want to get too much into it, but the difference between a contactee and an abductee is the fact that aliens land and they talk with you. Uh, so this is a number of stories. You have Woodrow Derenberger, George Adamski. Abductees are people like Betty and Barney Hill or Travis Walton where they are taken against their will and horrific things start happening to them. The contactee movement is what the general UFO scene looked like prior to Betty and Barney Hill's abduction in 1961. And Southern California was a huge place for the contactee movement. And in fact, one of the mountains right next to Mount Olympus is called Palomar Mountain. Palomar Mountain was home to a very famous contactee, a man named George Adamski, who was photographing UFOs at the same time that Everett Lee says he was in contact with interplanetary visitors. I haven't been able to find a concrete connection between the two, or if they knew each other or whatnot, but I have no doubt that Everett Lee knew about George Adamski to some extent. And another thing about the contactees is a lot of contactees have a similar ideology. It's a kind of new age spiritualist approach to Christianity, uh, the concept of universal law. Uh, aliens are friendly, they're space brothers. They don't want us to use nuclear weapons. All of that seems to be in line with some of Everett Lee's philosophy. And if you think I'm skimming over this too much or too quickly, don't worry. I am plan on fully diving into this topic in future episodes. So everything we've been talking about has been pretty much speculation. We've analyzed his book as much as possible, but I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to know more about Everett Lee, and I kind of became obsessed a little bit. I spent a good chunk of the month of September, maybe even October, really, really digging into the history of Everett H. Lee as much as I possibly could. And this is what I dug up. Everett Harvey Lee was born on September 22, 1882, on Prince Edward Island in Canada. His father was Bertram Lee, and his mother was Mary Smith. 
and he had 10 other siblings. His entire childhood is unknown. However, in 1906, when he was 24, he met a man named Noel J. Ogilvie, who was chief of the Canadian Boundary Survey, and he was hired on to this crew that was helping to establish the 49th parallel. So the 49th parallel is the latitude line that established the border between Canada and the United States. And there were actually crews in the early 1900s who were people out there establishing that line of latitude. And Everett H. Lee was actually part of this crew. Then just three short years later, he was up in Alaska doing the exact same thing, establishing the boundary between Alaska and the Yukon territories. Then in 1912 through 1916, he was doing some supervising of gold mines. I'm not entirely sure what his role was, whether he was part of the mining crew or if he was checking to see if they were safe. Even though I don't know exactly what his role was while he was in Alaska, I do actually know a lot about of some of his adventures that he had up there due to a series of articles that Lee wrote actually in the 1950s. Some include encounters with bears, encounters with mountain goats, avalanches, and a whole bunch of other things that are kind of exciting. Then in 1919, he married his wife, Carolyn Lee Phillips, in Vancouver, British Columbia. I found a certificate of arrival that places him in San Francisco in 1923. After that, him and Carolyn moved to the city of Long Beach, and it actually appears that Carolyn's sister, Epinesa Phillips, lived with them as well. And her name is actually on the 1940 census. So she lived with them in Long Beach and lived with them in the compound as well. So about the same time he moves to Long Beach, Lee starts delivering public speeches. The articles refer to them as psychology lectures, often referring to Lee himself as a teacher of natural science. There's a couple of good names in here too. So there's geology, a means to enlightenment, the teaching and practice of a psychology that has a constructive influence on society, and my personal favorite, why thinkers are few and non-thinkers are multitudinous. So in 1936, he purchases the property where he established the compound. Then in 1942, these psychology lectures kind of morph into something else. He gives two lectures on the New World Order and dubs himself a philosopher and metaphysician. If you don't know what a metaphysician is, basically the gist is, going back to some ancient philosophers, Aristotle wrote two books. One on physics, which is the way the natural world works, and the second book being metaphysics, which is the way the spirit world works. So for Everett Lee to call himself a metaphysician implies that he had some sort of metaphysical control or something like that, which obviously ties into everything he's talking about with, you know, universal law and order and things like that. There's a newspaper clipping from 1946 that says that Miss Mary Adams, whoever that is, had a luncheon with Everett Lee to discuss the Olympian Society. I want to get into this just a little bit because whether Mrs. Mary Adams was a potential benefactor or someone he was trying to convince to come to the compound, I'm not sure because we have several things happening. We have that newspaper article that details how a wife leaving her husband, taking his money and taking their children and going to live on Mount Olympus with Everett Lee. And then you also have James Boynton Smith, who, if you recall, he actually owned the property for a long period of time. That man is not listed on the 1940 census. So was he just a benefactor? Was he friends with Everett Lee? What was his relationship to the Olympian Society? I don't know. That makes me wonder what his luncheon with Mrs. Mary Adams was all about. What we do know is that later that year, Carolyn Lee, Everett Lee's wife, died. I haven't been able to find any newspapers referencing the Olympian Society after that. However, in June of 1947, he did write that letter to Kenneth Arnold. So the Olympian Society was still going at that time. 
However, 1947 held another surprise for Everett Lee, which was that John B. South, his co-leader, had a heart attack on the side of the road. And that's when it really disappears. I have not been able to find any trace of the Olympian Society after 1947. It didn't seem to slow down his philosophical writings because his book was copyrighted and published in 1956. Then it's completely silent in the 1960s. And then we get the confirmation that Lee died on April 9th, 1972 in Riverside, California. So having assembled that timeline of Everett Lee's life, out of all the questions that there are still left to ask about it, the one that was most pressing for me was why Temecula? I've got a few thoughts. So number one, he wanted to get out of the city. And if he already had some ideas about interplanetary travel or things like that, the skies are really open and dark out where he homesteaded there at the top of the hill. In fact, when I came to Temecula in 1988, there was a rule that you can't have bright street lights here. It has to be yellowed or dimmer street lights because of Mount Palomar Observatory. So it doesn't interfere with their view of the stars. So for a while, this may have been a place known for good visibility of the stars, for the skies, the night skies. I, I guess when people are considering alien visitation, you think about light in the sky. I don't really, I, I don't really know about that, but that's just a thought. My second thought is, he was a little bit different from other people. Yes. <laughs> and he had some unusual ideas. He was a nonconformist. And it's very possible that he wanted space to sort out what his thoughts and beliefs were. So maybe it was just a, a place aside, like a, a place of personal retreat and ponderance away from all the noise and away from all the stimulus of, of being around people and, and vehicles and things like that. So that's, those are my two thoughts on that. Temecula is a small town in Southern California, at least it used to be. In fact, it used to be super small. Temecula became a settlement because of its close proximity to water. You need water to live. And when there is water, there is a plentiful wildlife. So that's food in the form of animal. And also grasses grow and so on. And so there's the possibility of vegetation that's edible. So back in the very beginning, we had Native American people here who recognized the resources that were in our valley. And, and it was rich. The official Temecula started with the post office, 1859. That's what the city has adopted as the beginning. And that was, again, the post office. But there was certainly activity here before that. And the post office was the result of the Overland Butterfield trail and stage that came through, because it then delivered mail. So this was a trail leading from Missouri all the way to San Francisco which was basically just a trail to deliver mail. And it ran through Temecula. We already had like a few settlers, trappers, and, and other European people who had come into this area, but there was not a very big settlement at all. So this was a big deal. For a long time, Temecula's main export was cattle and grain and it was because of the Vale legacy. So in 1904, a man named Walter Vale moved to Temecula and began purchasing land. He ended up purchasing about 87,500 acres of land. And it was basically all just ranch land. So I think what Walter Vale was looking for 
ranch-wise was, okay, a place I can uh, graze my cattle and a place that I can get them to market. That was the other thing. That's the expense that goes into it. So the Vail Company was centered where Vail Headquarters is today. Vail Headquarters was the original town of Temecula. The trail came through there. The Wolf Store was the general store and the post office, and it had hotel rooms for travelers coming along the trail. You can see the Vail legacy all over Temecula, from the Vail Ranch headquarters to Vail Lake to, I mean, basically anything that says Vail on it is in relation to Walter Vail. So the Vail headquarters, the Vail family, the Vail Ranch dominated commerce in the area. The bank was put in basically to supply payroll for the Vail Company. Everybody who lived in Temecula was involved in the Vail Ranch somehow. You know, they were the ones that they were the prime mover and anybody that worked here either worked for the cattle ranch, uh, either it could be a cook on the ranch or, or, or a cowboy. But when you came into Temecula, you basically didn't see a whole lot until you got to where the Palomar Hotel is now today. So coming from the north, you'd see the Palomar Hotel. Then you would see the bank. The bank was built in like 1917. On the left-hand side, you would see what had at one time been the Machado store. Today it's 1909, a restaurant. And it had been different things through different eras. And there was a, a smaller bridge than our beautiful one that we have today. So that was Temecula in the 1940s. So with Temecula kind of being one of the places where mail was flowing in and out of, it was outside of the city, but still in touch with the world around. And I think maybe that's why Lee might have chose Temecula, because he could be living up in the mountains and then come down for a lunch one day and basically be right in the middle of town. So as far as we can tell, the Olympian Society was a religious cult. They had uh, prophecies of end times. They sought refuge with a, a leader and his his personal truth, and some strange things happened as a result, including the mysterious death of one of Everett Lee's partners, John B. South. They dug a big tunnel into the side of a mountain looking for a biblical city or, or refuge from a calamity. Everett Lee convinced many people to uproot their lives, donate their life savings to his cause, People were, people were attracted to his message. I think Everett Lee saw the direction the world was going, especially with these esoteric, strange things beginning to happen. I think he adapted what was happening in the world to fit his view of the world. It's easy to paint Everett Lee as kind of just like this crazy cult leader, who might have been a nudist or, you know, whatever theories are floating around. But I think that would be lacking depth in sort of the analysis of what's going on there. Because, well, as I mentioned earlier, when I kind of contextualized everything that happened in his lifetime, I mean, I think with Everett Lee, we're seeing a man who was scared of how much the world was changing. And his answer to that was a new kind of religion. Clearly the old ways weren't working, not entirely. So he reinvented it in a way that made sense to him. And he thought that it could catch on. Maybe in some part, Lee was kind of sad at how much the world was changing too. I mean, I've seen it growing up here in Temecula. In, according to the 2000 census, Temecula had a population of 50,000 people, which is still a lot, definitely more than it was when Lee and his cronies were living on the mountain up there, but according to the 2020 census, that number is well over 100,000. I mean, 
and they're still developing. They're, they're continuing to build and build and build. I have this photo. When I was up in Washington, I hung out with my good friend Todd Hale for about a day. We took this photo in front of Mount Rainier. The spot that we're standing in in that photo is going to be a house in less than a year. It's not just happening here in Temecula, it's happening all over the place. It, these small towns are losing their small town charm because they're no longer small towns anymore, they're small cities. A lot of the charm that Temecula had, it's outside of LA, it's not a city. You can come here for fresh air, you can get away from all that. And now there's traffic at 1 p.m. It wasn't like that, it wasn't always like that. I'm not anti-city by any means, but I mean, that's what made Temecula special. And that's what makes a lot of small towns special is that they're different from the cities. But as they're being built up, they're becoming cities as well. And uh, I think that's really a shame. What I hope we find out about Everett Lee, I hope we can find a photograph. I want to know what he looked like. I guess I'm, I'm still kind of in my obsessive mode. I want to learn as much as possible about him because I'm completely fascinated with this guy. I hope we can find his other two books so we can peruse them and see if it has more clues. I wish we had some personal papers of his that would spell out all of his personal life story and philosophy and just enlighten us as to what the activities were at uh, the Mount Olympus Olympian Society, what his goals were, and what he feels like he achieved. I don't know if we'll ever find those out, but I, I love modern technology that we can reach a little farther these days. I really want to find pictures. Like, I want to see what these people look like. I want to see pictures of the Olympian Society compound itself. I would like to know more about what they actually taught. We know the surface level. We, we know that they were afraid of the West Coast flooding. We know that they believed that entities from different planetary systems would visit. We know that they were interested in UFOs, but that's all very surface level. I'd like to know just more about what the individuals thought, what day-to-day -day life was on the Olympian Society compound. I'd like to know if they continued reaching out to Kenneth Arnold. I'd like to know if they continued their pursuit of uh, UFO truth. If I find more, I'll share it. But that's all we know. Until next time, friends.